everyone. I'm Erica Lechuk. I'm the Northwest Regional Specialist with Sikkim, or Southern Indiana Cooperative Invasives Management. Uh, one of my main roles is to teach people why they should remove invasive species and why it's important to plant native plants. So I thought, what is better than showing off our uh, native plants that we've incorporated into our landscaping at home? Uh, one thing I did want to say is that our native plants have um, a very complex relationship with the native wildlife that we have, such as insects and birds. And without our native plants, uh, those wildlife will continue to decline. So that's why I wanted to show how important it is to have these native plants in our landscaping. So these are three of our most common invasives that we find on our property, all right next to each other. So this first one, um, is reed canary grass, and I wanted to show you how it grows, um, I don't know, just the style of how it grows and pops up. It just looks like a typical grass, but if you pick a piece and you pull the leaf down, you'll be able to see this clear sheath or ligule popping up, and that's one way to identify reed canary grass. Plus, it greens up pretty early in the spring. Another one that most people have on their property is Asian bush honeysuckle. It's opposite and it's a shrub. And right now in Northwest Indiana, it's starting to leaf out. So in Southern Indiana, it's probably already fully leafed out, but we're a little bit behind. And then the last one is garlic mustard. Um, that tends to take over the herbaceous layer in a woodland setting. Um, it's really easy to pull. You just take it at the base and you can pull out the entire root system. Um, it's best to take all these plants and put them in a trash bag and you can either let them dry out and burn them or just throw them out with your trash but keep them in the bag so um, you don't spread the seeds. It's still a little early here but in a couple weeks you'll see a white flower forming on the plant. So I just mentioned the invasive species that we've been managing here for the past five years. Um, and I wanted to show you an area here where we've had a pretty good handle on them among our beautiful white oak trees. So the first native plant I'm going to show you is wild columbine. It has a really pretty dainty flower that you'll see this time of year. But unfortunately up here it's a little bit too early to see it in flower but it has a really pretty red and yellow bell-shaped flower. The other one is Virginia bluebell, and I'll show you a better example of it over here. Um, the Virginia bluebell is about to flower up here. Um, it is not specifically native to this area of Indiana, even though it is found south of here, but we decided to incorporate it into um, our property because in this region, in the sand, we don't have a lot of early spring wildflowers, so we thought this would be a great addition. And then the other one that you'll find um, all over here is uh, the Spring Beauty, and it has little slender leaves with a nice uh, pink and white little flower. And this is just an area of our property that we've been working on for a while, and we're really proud of it. You just saw our video that showed our property after management, but these are some pictures of our property five years ago before we started our management. You can see that there are some lower quality silver maples and non-native black locusts that we've removed and thinned out. And also the property was just very overgrown with raspberries. Uh, the raspberries are native, but we thinned those out um, and got rid of a lot of them just to increase the diversity on our property. So we're at the second site on our property, which is our example of a sand prairie. And this is a good example of um, if you were installing a prairie on just pure sand or soil that had no vegetation on it. 
but I am going to introduce my husband, Derek, who is a land manager with the Nature Conservancy because he did all the dirty work of um, prepping the site and putting the seats down. Hey everybody, Derek Luchek, um, out here on our property in Northeast Jasper County. Um, you can see around, we've got an acre here um, that we converted into a sand prairie community, which was once uh, very common in this part of the state and in Jasper County. Um, when we moved into this uh, property, this was an abandoned farm field that the farmer decided was too dry and sandy to farm anymore um, reasonably. So, um, and that's a really great example of a site where native plants are a good option. You know, you're not going to be able to crop it. You're not going to be able to grow grass. You're probably not going to be able to grow um, any other kind of crop, um, plant, vegetables, or fruits on it. Um, so really all I had to do here was let the site grow up. It was nothing but annual weeds. Um, I did burn it off in the fall. And then um, I collected about 40 different species of native plants. And it's just as simple as collecting the plant material, getting the seeds off of the plant material as best as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then just waiting for about um, three or four frosts in the fall and then getting out and just spreading the seed. And all that you have to do after that is wait. Um, on a lot of sites, you'll have a lot of weed management. Um, this is a very harsh, dry environment. So weed management isn't really that necessary, which is great. Um, you can look around here and there's all kinds of different plants. It's really early in the year, so there's not a lot going on, but the little blue stem is, is very easy to see right now. Um, if we walk over here, you can also see small clumps of a short-lived, very common plant in the sand areas of Northwest Indiana. This is Landsleeve Coreopsis, really attractive spring bloomer. Um, a lot of people are familiar with Coreopsis. There's several varieties that people grow in gardens. Another cool one that always piques people's interest in this part of the state, and I'm not gonna touch it either because it'll leave prickers in me, is um, Eastern Prickly Pear. This is a native cactus. Um, and uh, I, I collected pads, which you can see here, there's one that fell off over the winter and that'll actually just um, root in on its, on its own and, and grow a new cactus. Um, Let's see here. Let's try to find some other things. It's again, it's really early, um, and so finding specific things coming up can be pretty tough. But there is a lot out here. Uh, one that is really exciting, and and another uh, very common plant in this part of the state uh, where areas have been left undisturbed is wild lupin. Um, and so that's one of our earliest spring bloomers that we have. And uh, this site is, is now just loaded with it. And again, all I, all I had to do was collect the seed and spread it at the right time. Um, and in the case, if you were gonna just um, purchase seed, you would just purchase it and just uh, make sure your site is prepared and, and spread it at the right time. These are some photos of our prairie during the growing season. Uh, the one in early May, you can see the wild lupin with those bluish purple flowers in the photo on the top left. And then you can see from last year in May, uh, later on in that month, the coreopsis starts flowering. And then you can see in the photo at the bottom right uh, in August that there's a gray-headed coneflower and little blue stem and the prairie is just more full of life and thriving by the end of summer. All right, hey everybody, we're up front now um, on the last segment of the video. Probably a lot of people were looking at that and saying, well, I don't have an acre um, of property or I don't have something that is a uh, not a good farm field or just, you know, no, no extra acreage on the property to use. Um, but everybody's got a place where they can do some kind of um, pollinator plot or a micro prairie or whatever kind of um, 
name that you want to ascribe to it. And uh, on our property here, we thought what better way to do it than uh, have some native plants and vegetation on both sides of the driveway. And you can see on this side, we've got a little strip here. It just kind of looks like an unmaintained lawn right now to be totally truthful and honest. Um, but as the year progresses, um, there's a whole lot of uh, diversity and different grasses and flowers and things that are growing in both of these areas. On this side of the driveway is a um, broadcast seating that was uh, quite similar to the, um, uh, the acre sand prairie out back um, in that it was a broadcast seating. Uh, originally, it was just a lawn with a few non-native ornamental um, trees like calorie pear and uh, some other things in there as well. And, uh, and also, of course, it had an established area of turf grass. Um, before you do these type of plantings, you do need to address that. Um, the way that I went about it here was I just uh, simply sprayed the grass um, with a... Uh, a low percentage solution of um, glyphosate. Um, people commonly know that by the um, trade name Roundup. Um, if you don't want to do that too, I mean, that's perfectly fine. You can find another route to go, either laying um, black plastic down on whatever area you want to do, or if you have um, uh, animals like chickens, you could enclose them over the area that you want to do it on and and let them eat everything down um, because they will do that. Um, or let's say you got an area that um, you want to add some grass to on your property and you can just um, sod that up um, and take the sod away and put it where you want to. And the great thing is these native plants, honestly, they're going to thrive in that soil um, even after that topsoil is gone anyway. So it won't be an issue, but you got you to gotta prepare it. Um, and so on this side, again, that's what I did. And then also on this side was a, a similar situation. And um, I did use the same method. Uh, and again, once you have all of that dead grass, um, what I do is um, I do burn it off um, and, you know, just exercise caution when you're doing that. Um, but yeah, it's a great way to come home in the summer. You know, you come home from work, whatever, groceries, um, and you've got entertainment right there, right as you drive in the driveway up to your house. And, uh, I mean, this whole area is just buzzing with bees and butterflies and everything else. Um, it's still early in the year and we are in the Northwest part of the state. And, uh, in fact, uh, our part of the state is one of the last to wake up. Um, but you still can see there's quite a few things coming up in here as Erica pans around with the camera, you can see, um, you know, if, if these plants weren't here, you really would have just a really thick um, bed of annual weeds, much things like um, purple dead nettle and just other things like that. But what's really interesting is you'll see there's a lot of bare soil in here that is unoccupied. Below ground, though, there is quite the occupation of, of really strong perennial root systems from these plants. Um, and you can see here we've got some uh, goldenrod. It's, this is a, a low stature variety of goldenrod uh, behind it with the kind of hard to see right now, but the sort of purpley green stems is one of the uh, um, mountain mints that is native to the state. Over here is a early um, blooming um, prairie plant, uh, penstemon. Um, <clears throat> Several varieties of asters in here, several varieties of indigos. Uh, my favorite uh, grass in the prairie and in the home landscaping. This is uh, prairie drop seed coming up. Um, you know, another thing to remember too about these plants, a lot of these things have root systems that are at a minimum five feet deep. Um, so you talk about the uh, um, benefits that you're getting with uh, soil stability and water infiltration. Um, just on top of everything that you see on the surface. Uh, moving over here. And here's a skeleton of one of the plants from last year, um, which the name has escaped me, Wild Senna. Um, and this is about the tallest that all this stuff gets. So that's another thing that you just kind of got to be willing to let things grow and do what they're going to do. 
Um, and later, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about a more controlled environment. But in a situation like this, you got to be willing to let things go and, and let them do what they're going to do um, because it's about um, benefiting other things and not necessarily just the visual aesthetics, aesthetics for you. <clears throat> Here's another really cool plant that we've got grown in here. Um, this is Rattlesnake Master, um, one of the more interesting and exotic looking uh, native plants that we have. Uh, you can see wild lupin has found its way in here as well that we saw earlier. Um, <clears throat> a lot of things coming up and there's a lot of, of, of little weeds too. You, you're always gonna be weeding this um, and, and probably you're not gonna get away from that. You know, dandelions are still in here, things like that. Um, but it's not a big deal. Once these native plants get going, they really take hold and, and you don't have to worry about much and just having it right in the driveway. I mean, who doesn't want to come home and have immediate entertainment and have all kinds of things blooming and uh, bees and butterflies and hummingbirds buzzing around and things like that. So just a great way to do something uh, at home uh, right when you pull in. Both of these photos show the area before we installed the front prairie. Uh, the first photo on the bottom right is before we purchased our home and you can see in front of me that the entire area is turf grass and then the photo on the top left is uh, where you can see that the turf grass has been sprayed out and killed and there were calorie pairs lining the driveway so this is during the removal of those uh, they're a highly invasive tree so they were cut down and the stumps were treated These photos show the front of our house um, during the past three growing seasons. You can see in July 2017, uh, that was after two years and everything is coming in very happy, but um, it's a little bit thinner than you would notice now. Uh, for example, in 2018 and 2019, you can see um, how all the native plants have just filled in those open areas um, and how you can enjoy those beautiful flowers throughout the growing season. So I hope you enjoyed all the different sites on our property where we've done some restorations and or pollinator gardens. But I know um, some people might still say, I don't have room, I just wanna put something around the house. Um, so we do have a little bit of that going on and I wanted to show you that. Uh, we have little blue stem here um, in different corners of the house. And we have two different species of blazing stars. Uh, this is from last year, so we haven't cut it back yet, but it should be popping up soon. And throughout here too, we have a, a couple different plants of wild indigo. Um, none of that stuff is coming up yet, but I just wanted to show you how you can incorporate a few native species into your landscaping just around the house too. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed this and I just wanted to say through SICKM, um, I do offer free landowner surveys. So if you don't know what you have on your property, whether it's invasive or native, I can come to your property for free and identify it and write you a management plan on how to get rid of those invasives. Um, my contact information is Erica, E-R-I-C-A, at sikkim, S -I -C -I -M, dot info. Um, please reach out to me if you have any other questions and I hope you turn your yard into a pollinator paradise.